in just a few moments, we're going to wrap today up by um, lighting candles, and I know that that's a, a special moment. And um, but before we do that, I want to just kind of share a, a thought with you. And um, you know, you you've, we're here because of this story, right? It, um, regardless of where people are in their understanding of who Jesus is in their life, uh, most people have some sense of the Christmas story. They've either heard it at school or they've heard it at church or maybe it was read during Christmas time and they went on to see their family. And it's, it seems like it's just an incredibly simple story. It's, it's two young teenagers who had absolutely nothing. And God chose them to bring the Savior of the world into existence. And it, it's just 20 verses right there in the Gospel of Luke where we hear the story of how God took on human clothes and came to live among us and how that would be good news for the entire human race. And I've been thinking lately, if you were to plop someone down on this planet who had never heard the Christmas story, was unfamiliar with all of the customs of Christmas, and you were only given one word that you could describe to fully explain what Christmas is to that person, what word do you think you would choose? Joy? Um, some of us might choose the word joy, right? These are usually the gift givers in our bunch. Um, they like to bake stuff and deliver it to the entire neighborhood. They start listening to Christmas music the day after Halloween. <laughs> um, and you know exactly who you are, right? Because that's you. Um, maybe some of us, we would choose something um, Profound yet generic, right? Like for us, when we experience Christmas or think about Christmas, we think about family. Um, these are the people that like piling up in the car and going out and looking at Christmas lights. And um, they're really into things like Elf on the Shelf, right? Don't you love those people? And sending out Christmas cards. People still do that, believe it or not. Um, maybe you just think fun, right? I have some people in my life that I think they would choose the word fun. These are the yard decoration people who cannot wait to see what Walmart releases, right? Because it's maybe the potential of a brand new inflatable. These are the folks that go um, kind of property line to property line. They've got everything. Like they even went to Bucky's this year, right? Now we finally have a Bucky's. And they've got the big beaver blown up in their front yard for just be glory for the entire neighborhood. I've got a guy in my neighborhood like that. Love that guy. Um, Maybe you choose a word like peace. And the reason that you come out on a Christmas Eve is because you want to hear that, that song, right? Silent night, holy night. And there's just something about um, the world coming to a stop this one night a year that, that speaks into our souls. Maybe if you're a parent especially or you're a grandparent, you think of kids and there's this idea that Christmas is all about wonder. It's all about the unknown. It's that expectation, that surprise of what's going to happen on Christmas Day. If I were going to sum up Christmas in a single word, I would choose what someone said. It's the word love. And if you're a regular part of our church, you are already thinking, well, Stephen, can we not go one Christmas without hearing about love, right? Because it's, it's every year. In fact, it's almost every weekend. And you're thinking, it would be so cool if you just choose another theme. But I honestly would choose the word love. Because I believe that the one phrase that God would communicate to every single human being, I think the one thought that God would want to sink into every human soul, it's the idea that God loves you. It's that simple. God absolutely loves you. No matter what other people in your life might think of you, God loves you. Like, even if tonight your mama is not too thrilled with you, I promise you that God still loves you. And the writers of Scripture, that's going to be a fun night right there. Uh, the writers of Scripture say some pretty huge things about God's love. And I'm convinced if you and I will grab hold of that, regardless of where we are in our relationship with God, I think it will make a difference in our lives. And it really can become good news. One of the things they say is that God's love for us is so vast that it cannot be measured. In fact, the apostle Paul, Paul wrote about this a long time ago. He said, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand 
as all God's people should, how wide and how long, how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, here it is, though it is too great to understand fully. See, the principal reason God's love cannot be measured is because it has no limit. It's too big for any human being to possibly comprehend. And the reason it is difficult to comprehend God's love is it is so often unlike the love that you and I experience in our daily life. I think if we stopped and reflected on the kind of love that we experience, it almost always feels like there's a caveat or an expectation or there's some strings attached. And if you aren't careful, you can go your entire life with sort of this background noise, just constantly reminding you that you gotta wait because the other shoe will eventually drop. But that's not the case with God. That's why Paul says, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. See, unlike so many of our own experiences, God never runs out of love. And think about that for a second. God never runs out of love. I suspect there's more than one person who's sitting here today or who's watching online. It's been a long time since somebody reminded you that God actually loved you. And you may already be thinking to yourself, yeah, but you don't know, and you're right, I don't know. But what I do know is the proclamation that Paul makes, that it is impossible for God to run out of love. It is immeasurable. You can't comprehend the depth of God's love. And I don't know about y'all, but that gives me a great deal of comfort because that means that I can't run far enough and I can't mess up enough for God to stop loving me because I'm loved not based on how I perform or how I don't perform. I'm loved because of what God already did on my behalf. And that leads me to another bit of good news. Because God's love has no limits, it also cannot be extinguished. Again, Paul writes in Romans chapter eight, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. See friends, that's good news. That means that God loves you on your best day and God loves you on your worst day. God loves you when your heart is just filled with gratitude and you're happy to be alive and God loves you when you're weighed down with pain and confusion or you're wrecked with absolute anger. God loves you when you're able to trust him without even thinking about it and God loves you when you don't think he's anywhere near you. God loves you when you're sober And God loves you when you're not. God loves you when you're just breaming with confidence and you're ready to take on the world and you feel useful and strong. And God loves you when you feel anxious or weak or you feel absolutely useless, like no one cares anything about you. God loved you the day that your mama put you in a crib. And God will love you the day that you leave your deathbed. And I know for a fact that there are a bunch of us and you're thinking to yourself right now, Man, I love that. In fact, that's why I come to Christmas Eve. It's because I want to be reminded that God loves me, but you don't know. Maybe you're thinking you've gone too far, or maybe you've sinned too much, or you're in too deep, or maybe you've made too many bad decisions. And with people, that may be true. You may have alienated your spouse. You may have disappointed a parent. You may have neglected a friend. You may have embarrassed your kids. And you may have done it when you walked in because you wanted to take a Christmas photo and they didn't want to do that. (laughs) See, the reality is all human love is imperfect, but not God's. See, with God, you can always come home. As long as you're drawing air into your lungs, you got a second, third, 1,000th opportunity to make it right. You can't run far enough. You can't fall hard enough. You can't fail um, too many times. See, that's, that's the message of Christmas. That's what makes today so special. That's why there is a uniqueness. There's a draw. There's something sacred about this season and about this night in particular that tugs, I think, into the depths of every human heart. 
And I know sometimes we forget that Christmas is not our birthday. And we can get lost up in all the shopping and the picture taking and the putting up of lights and decorations and the gift wrapping and the unwrapping. It's easy to get swept up in sort of the feel good holiday stuff and the stocking stuffers and Christmas parties and trying to outdo each other or wearing the ugliest sweater. But there is a clear reason why on this night, there are tens of millions of people across this planet who are packing into churches. It's because of this simple story. It's this story, Joseph, Mary, baby Jesus. Born in a cave, surrounded by shepherds. That somehow best encompasses the idea of love. You know, this story began with a promise made by a prophet to a fledgling nation called Israel. And in their darkest moment, when it felt like their backs were against the wall and when it seemed like they had nowhere to turn and when it looked like they had no reason to have hope whatsoever, Isaiah answers God's call and he finds the courage to stand up in front of an entire nation. And he began to talk about a day about a single event, a moment in time when everything was gonna be made right again. And he was honest with them. They weren't experiencing it right now, but he had the courage to say, that day is coming, don't you lose sight. Here's what he says, nevertheless. In other words, regardless of what you're facing right now, um, in spite of feeling like you've got no more answers, even though you feel like God has abandoned you. He says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. Now imagine you're a part of the nation of Israel and you've lost everything. Your land, your people, your leadership, your language, your identity. You've been scattered everywhere by your enemy. And then here's this guy that, that acknowledges, yeah, you're walking in darkness, but I need you to know, not that a light will come, but a light has come. Not that a son will be born, but a son is born. Can you imagine what that would do to you? Can you imagine that sense of hope that people started to feel that maybe God had not abandoned them and maybe God had not forgotten about the nation of Israel? I just imagine if we were to put ourselves in that story that maybe, just maybe, for the first time in a long time, there started to be a little flicker of hope. But there's one problem. Decades went by, and then centuries went by, and nothing happened. But then one day there were these two teenagers, Mary and Joseph. And they came from absolutely nothing. And they came from a backwoods little bitty town that nobody ever cared about. And they find themselves in little more than a barn. And right there in the dirt of that stable, this couple becomes a family. And just like that, the promise made through the prophets, prophets centuries earlier, it all began to come true. And in an ultimate act or sign of love, God became human, right? God became human. No other religion on our planet can make that claim. Christianity is the only one that clings to this idea of God living among us. We're not subjects. We're not supposed to be drones that were created to, to just do the bidding of our creator. That God wants to be in relationship with human beings, with all of our flaws, all of our shortcomings, all of our mistakes, all of the ways that we have a, 
a, an opportunity to disappoint God, he still chooses us to be with us. Eugene Peterson put it like this. He said, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. See, friends, that, that's the game changer. Because what that means on this night is that nobody has to go it alone. Nobody has to stumble their way through life. That means that redemption has now been made available, right? The word became flesh and blood. God intervened, God got involved. He literally moved in and that ought to give us hope. Because Christmas reminds us that the world is sometimes a very dark place. But the good news is 2,000 years ago, a light dawned, hope showed up. A child really was born, it's not a myth. A son had finally been given. And the scriptures promise that he will usher in justice and peace, that he'll defeat evil and darkness once and for all. And on his shoulders literally rests the future of everything, not just of the world, but the future of your life and my life. Even if we don't realize it, it rests on this, this man named Jesus. And because of Jesus, even death does not get to have the final word. And if death doesn't get the final word, then that means you and I've got nothing to fear. You don't have to fear pain because everybody's gonna experience it. You don't have to fear regret because we're all gonna make mistakes and wish that we could take it back. You don't have to fear seasons of struggle or failure or depression. You don't have to live in fear of an addiction or loneliness or loss or a broken dream or whatever sin that you found yourself caught up in. See, Christmas reminds us that with Jesus, Jesus nothing is impossible. And if you play that out, if nothing is impossible with Jesus, well, then that means that anything is possible. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done, the message of Christmas is that if you got Jesus, you got all you need. And so on this night in particular, we're simply called to have hope. That's it. You don't have to get it perfect. You just have to have hope. And the reason we hope is because on a dim night, in the midst of darkness and anxiety and chaos, God himself stepped out of heaven and took on human clothes that he might live with us. In his birth, <coughs> it marks the end of your past. And I know some of us, you've got that voice in your ear right now that's reminding you of what happened back there. His birth marks the fear of all of our imperfections, of every mistake or every failure that we've ever gone through, every hurt and every shortcoming. See, we hope because through the tender cries of an infant laid in a manger, a revolution was started that actually has the potential to change a human heart and completely redirect a human destiny. We have hope because this story did not end at the manger. It was actually just the beginning. We hope because this child one day grew up and in the single most unbelievable and incredible almost unthinkable act to prove his love. He allowed himself to suffer a horrific death, to be laid in a tomb only to be resurrected three days later. All of that with one purpose in mind, just simply to offer you and I a chance to be free. And I mean free. See, we have hope because God promises that there is a day yet to come. And I don't know if it's gonna be in our day or the day after that. But the scriptures are clear that on that day, it's gonna be like a day none other. There'll be no more sadness and there'll be no crying. People won't suffer anymore. Cancer will be eradicated. Sin is gonna be laid to rest and there'll be no more broken hearts among us. Every wrong is gonna be set right and justice is gonna flow like a river and freedom is gonna ring out from one corner of this sorry planet to the next. And until that day comes, we just simply have to hold on to hope. <clears throat> Friends, that's the reason that we've shown up tonight. That's the reason that the world stops. That's the hope that we're called to celebrate. And because of this one event, 
You and I are called to live every day with the same hope we had when we were kids. You remember when you were a kid? You remember when you got out of school and you had a few days before Christmas? You remember how crazy that felt on the inside? Didn't it feel like you had all the time in the world and that Christmas was never gonna come? And then when you went to bed that night, did you ever watch the clock and tell yourself, I'm gonna stay up. I'm gonna catch this guy when he comes in my house. You remember the first time you were actually able to stay, to, to stay up and you saw the clock, 11, 59, 59? Remember that feeling? Waiting on that last minute to click so it'd finally be midnight and it would be Christmas Day? That's the hope and the sense of wide-eyed wonder that you and I are called to live with every single day, to not get so caught up in what might happen tomorrow or what happened in our past, but to just learn to live in the moment. See, I think the angel was right to say that tonight I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born in the city of David, a savior who is the Messiah. Friends, be of good cheer this Christmas because you and I have a chance to live in hope. And so tonight, the only thing we have left is to light a candle. And um, this is one of my favorite parts of the season because um, all the lights kind of get turned out and we're just sort of left in that dim moment. And um, it's moments like this where I can't help think about how dark the world sometimes feels. I think about all the Christians around the world who are actually being persecuted. They're trying to figure out over these next few hours, can they gather at a neighbor's house? Or can they go into the woods? Or can they sneak off to some other place? And can they just gather with a couple of other Christians without worrying about being arrested or killed? I think about the people around the world who on this night while we're gathered here, they're facing the very real possibility of losing their life in a war. I think about how on the 18th, in Sophia Square in downtown Kiev, they put up a 34-foot Christmas tree. War-torn city, war-torn nation. And they put peace doves all over that tree as an act of defiance toward Russia. And they actually told Russia, you cannot take Christmas from us. I think about the people here in our community who are unhoused and having to deal with unbelievably cold weather. I think about the handful of people who've been a part of our church for a long time who are gathered not at church tonight, but they're sitting in hospitals around our city. And some of them are facing really dire situations. I think about those who've lost someone to an addiction. I think about people who've walked the lonely road of a divorce. I think about people who gather up because they feel like they've got nowhere else to go, but what they want more than anything else is to just hug their son or daughter's neck. I think about all the people for whom 2022 has been a really, really brutal year. And it just reminds me of the power of light the scriptures say that Jesus is the light of the world, that he's the answer to every, every question that has ever been asked, that he is the longing that every soul longs to experience. And when his light came into the world, it started to spread. And it is his light that will extinguish the darkness. And every Christmas I remember that when I was 17 years old, I gave my life to Jesus. And in that moment, there was a claim put on my life. And because of my salvation, I was called to be a giver of that light as well. And there are people all over this room who've said, that, who've said yes to Jesus. And it's our call to do what we can to share light. What makes this moment so special is we're gonna share the light with you guys. And I'm gonna encourage you to turn to your neighbor and share the light with them. And as light spreads all over this room, suddenly you'll see that there's no more darkness left. It's by divine design. So we pass the light, we're gonna sing that great Christmas carol, Silent Night. <laughs> 